Uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, it's very um, wonderful to be again with all of you guys um, to explore and discover yet another very important part of our faith. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you and your families protection and be a source of blessings as a result of your striving. Uh, today we are discovering some, discuss, discussing something really important and this very important day that all of us know about. The first thing I want you to know on this slide is it says Jumu'ah. Uh, because a lot of times people mispronounce this word and they say Juma. But if you look at the Arabic here very carefully, if you can read Arabic, you will see it says Jumu'ah. So it's the day of Jumu'ah, not Juma. So that's something that is important to note because um, most people, they just shorten it and they, they mispronounce it. They say Juma. You know, um, it's Jumu'ah. al Jumu'atu. In the full pronunciation. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says in the Quran, Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu iza nudiya lis-salati min yawmi al-jumu'ati fasa'u ila zikrillahi wa zarul bayr. Zalikum khayrulakum in kuntum ta'lamun. That, O oh believers, when the call is proclaimed or made to prayer on Friday, then hasten to the remembrance of Allah and leave off trading. That is better for you if you know. Now, this very important uh, pronouncement by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is saying when on Friday the call is made to prayer, you should leave your business, your, all this stuff in the dunya, and hasten to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means to go and establish the Jumu'ah uh, prayer, listen to the khutbah, and so on. And it is an amazing thing to witness that throughout hundreds of years, Muslims have responded to this call and this, this appeal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you don't send out flyers. We don't need to put up brochures. Uh, we don't need to send out special invitation to tell people about Jumu'ah. Every Muslim who is a little bit conscious knows that when Friday appears, that we must go and establish the service. And so it's, it's truly remarkable to see the commitment of Muslims to the day of Jumu'ah. Uh, and what is beautiful about it is that the most conscious among the Muslim community comes. The ones who have a little bit more Iman, they see the need to come and they come. So what you end up having in every masjid is the cream of your community coming there on Friday and sitting on those carpets, ready to listen and be inspired by the khatib. You know, it's an extraordinary moment. And many of our scholars have considered the day of Jumu'ah to be the most important day in the lives of the Muslim community. It is the most important time. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ tells us that, that Jumu'ah, Eid al that the Jumu'ah is the Eid of the week. So it is like an Eid, a gathering of, of large groups of people. So uh, all of us have to make effort to try to come for the Jumu'ah. It is not compulsory and the women are talking with the men. They have to uh, try to make the Jumu'ah um, and try to work and do as much as you can to get your jobs to facilitate this moment as possible. Uh, the minimum requirement there are many, many different views that scholars have had, almost 15 different positions. But the basic majority or the basic authentic opinion is that you need at least two people to make Jumu'ah. Two people plus the Khatib. Uh, so two person forms a Saf. The minimal amount required to form a Saf is two people. And so you require two people um, to make the Jumu'ah. Um, generally, Jumu'ah is supposed to be um, as large a gathering as possible. And so it is encouraged that if you have three, four, five messages in an area, that they should try if they can to actually have the Jumu'ah in one large place rather than each person go to their individual messages. And so you'll find in other countries or different places for the Jumu'ah, they will have a huge gathering with many, many messages coming together 
and praying it uh, rather than each masjid praying. So it's trying to establish large gatherings. Um, the, the day of Jumu'ah, it's an obligation on us and it's considered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam based on Abu Huraira said the best day on which the sun has risen is Friday. Uh, Adam was created on the day of Jumu'ah and on it he entered paradise and on it he'll be expelled and the hour will not be established but on a Friday. And this is a Sahih Muslim hadith. So this day is really a very important auspicious day for us. Um, the main benefit we get from the day of Jumu'ah is that it is uh, forgiveness for our sins. The Prophet mentioned the five daily salah, the Friday and Friday prayer to the next Friday prayer, al Jumu'ah, ila al Jumu'ah, and the, the, the fasting of Ramadan, ila Ramadan to Ramadan to Ramadan is expiation for the sins committed in between them, so long as major sins are avoided. And so this is a very important hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that anyone who uh, comes to the regularly to prayer and, and fast on Friday and Ramadan, then the sins between these two periods, one Ramadan to the next, one Friday to the next, you will be, your sins will be forgiven. The Prophet also mentioned that anyone, if anyone performs wudu properly, then comes to the Friday prayer, listens to the khutbah attentively and keeps silent, his minor sins between that Friday and the following Friday will be forgiven with the addition of three more days. But he who touches pebbles have caused an interruption. And this hadith talks about uh, a distraction which occurs in that sometimes when the companions were listening to the khutbah, they would uh, play with the little pebbles on the ground. Um, we do it in a different form. You will see people playing with the carpet or you know, playing with the treads on the carpet and doing that kinds of stuff. Um, you have to listen attentively to the khatib once um, they deliver the khutbah. And so if we're able to do that, then, and there are many, many hadith about this. There's one in Bukhari, which says, if a man takes a bath on Friday, as much as he, and, or he makes wudu, oils his hair, applies whatever perfume available to his, in his house, sets forth for the mosque, does not separate two people to make a seat for himself. Because sometimes people come and then they push two people aside and try to make a, an extra spot. This was something that the prophet disliked. And he performs his prayer, remains silent when the imam speaks, then his sins between that Friday and the other Friday will be forgiven. So there are many, many hadith about this, that when you come, you don't start breaking people up and trying to pass between two people and then you want to sit there, especially if you come late. The prophet ﷺ did not like people to come late and then they are trying to head to the front of the line. They're just walking, walking, pushing people to sit in the very front of the stuff. If you come late, stay at the back, stay where there's space. Don't just keep moving and disturbing people. And so there's also some consequences. Um, there are also many hadith that talks about the consequences. I just mentioned one here, which is uh, whoever misses three Friday prayers in a row without any proper valid excuse, Allah will put a seal over their heart. It will become harder for them to make more Jumu'ah because once you begin to miss three in a row, then the, the, the importance of it diminishes in your heart and it becomes easier to miss an next tree and an next tree and an next tree. And so it's really important if you don't have a good reason for missing Juma and you miss it, it's considered a major sin. So we've got to be very um, keen in trying to make sure we make all preparations we can to attend the Juma Asala. Uh, and so this hadith is not to be taken in a sense that well, I miss two, and if I catch the third, I'm still cool. And, you know, it is to emphasize the importance of the Jumu'ah that we try to um, attend as much and all the Jumu'ah as we can um, throughout the year. Now, for the Jumu'ah to be successfully established, there are really three entities that must coordinate. There's those who will be organizing the Jumu'ah. Those are the executives of masjids and masjid boards. And they're the ones who are trying to make sure the event happened, this day of Jumu'ah. Then you have the people who 
attend the Jumu'ah. Then you have the, the Khatib who delivers the sermon and most likely lead the Salah as well. So you have these three different entities trying to come together to create a successful Jumu'ah. Um, and any one of these fell, fall through, then the, the quality of that day will not be the same. You know, if you have um, a lapse in any one of these three entities, we will have problems. The organizers of the Jumu'ah have a tremendous responsibility to make sure that it is really um, established as successful as possible. So one of the things that they have to do is to make sure they prepare the venue, uh, to ensure that there's proper air, air condition and fans, microphone system work and a lot of messages. Unfortunately, this is one of the things that falls down. Um, we need to make sure that we have a good solid, you know, PA system in place and that you have um, facilities for sisters. You know, the, the sisters should not be shoved in a corner. We should have adequate space for them, adequate arrangements for them. Because one of the things in America is that sisters go to the masjid on Friday. This is not something that all the other countries in the world do. In a lot of countries, only the, the men go to the Jumu'ah because it's not compulsory in the sisters. But this is a very unique experience for Americans in that they, the women attend the masjid, you know, especially for the day of Jumu'ah. And so you've got to be able to have proper facilities for them. Now, they should be able to um, see the imam deliver the khutbah. Uh, in most masjids, this is a big fight um, because sometimes you will have the masjid where they would uh, put like a barrier or a, or a screen and you'll have the sisters sometime in another place and the brothers in one place. And so sometimes the sisters, they're hearing the audio version of the khutbah because they don't see the imam. While the brothers are getting the video audiovisual experience, the sisters are only listening with their ears. And that is less effective. So if sisters desire to see the Imam and the Prophet Sallallahu in his time, he didn't have any barrier between the women and the men. The men, the women were at the back and they were able to see. Um, in my masjid, what we have done, we have um, do a half and half system because there are some sisters who want the privacy. And so we screen half and then we leave half open. So those sisters who want to, you know, see the Imam and, and experience the full, because the Imam, they make, he makes gestures and public speaking issues as well. Um, it's more effective when you're actually seeing the person speaking. Uh, but we should make sure that the, the sisters are catered for. So part of the organizing responsibility is that vacuum and clean the carpets properly, you know, on Fridays. Um, all this is part of preparing the venue. Um, you should make sure you have adequate copies of the Quran. A lot, most people are now reading Quran from their phones, but you should have some physical copies available in case someone wants to come and to um, recite the Quran. Parking, when you come, you know, the, the parking should be arranged where there's enough and adequate parking for people coming. And sometimes you may need to have someone who is organizing the parking or, or directing people based on how bad or how difficult parking is in your community. Um, if you don't have enough parking, then you should preferably have someone who's directing traffic. Overflow members, you have to cater for that, that you may have members who are, uh, the message is filled up, where do you put these people? You know, so you have to have some kind of arrangement where we can maybe have some extra carpets or something to spread out uh, that they can um, pray outside. Um, shoes, You've got to have a good system where people can put their shoes. Uh, this is always a big problem. Um, so you need to create, whilst you're organizing the Juma, make sure you have proper system of shoes. You should have at least one clock in which the Khatib sees that, that is the official clock. So whilst he's given a khutbah, he's knowing that that's the one, the time I'm going by. Sometimes you have many clocks in the masjid and each one of them have a different time. But you need to be able to let the Khatib know that this is our official clock. This is what we're going by. We're giving the azan by this time and we are finishing by this time. So in this way, they, they, there's one clock that is available and easy for the, the khatib to see because sometimes khatibs in the middle of their talk, they get carried away and they forget that they are on a clock that they're supposed to finish in time. 
and they don't, and then they end up going very late. This is not good and not acceptable. The, you should have a clear Salat charts that are available for people to see the different times of prayer. You want when people come to the Jumu'ah, they must be able to see the rest of the daily Salat time. So in this way, if their hearts go boo-boop and they say, you know what, I think I should start praying daily Salat, they can quickly take a picture of that chart on their phone and then they have the times of the prayer right there. Um, because not every masjid posts it on their website and so on. So those who are coming for the Jumu'ah, you know, you should have it where they can easily make a copy or, or a picture and they have the times for the prayers. Because the times of the prayers change quite often. Uh, you should cater for emergency. You should make sure you have a first aid kit and you have a, emergency arrangements. You know, a lot of times we get in our masjid, for example, we have a particular turn and we have to try to make sure that you always have space where an emergency vehicle can come in. We have been sometimes fined for that because if an emergency vehicle come in and they can't get to the patient or the person who is in trouble, uh, they end up charging you for that. So they are fining you for that. So that's why we keep telling people don't park in areas that we say don't park in. It's not because we're trying to deprive you of parking, but it's because we have to leave certain areas clear so that emergency vehicles come, someone gets a heart attack or something like that. We have to be able to have that. Um, so it's very important that we, the people who are organizing the Jumu'ah have an arrangement for that. The wonderful thing is that in most, any Muslim crowd, there are always about 10, 12, 15 doctors available. You know, so um, the best place to get sick is actually in a Muslim gathering. You know, you, you, you always have a lot of qualified people running up to you. Um, cameras, you should have cameras. This is a big issue um, with a lot of the mischiefs. The cameras serve many purposes. Uh, we had a case with, you know, <clears throat> somebody hit somebody's car. We didn't have no camera for it, you know, then it becomes a problem. Um, if unauthorized people come in a premises, you know, at least you have cameras. Uh, so this is really a, a critical and important thing to have cameras available. Security, you should make sure the venue is secure and to have some arrangements in terms of security. Um, there are many different ways and arrangements in which this is done. Um, usually in my masjid, if I see someone very strange come who have not come before, I would usually immediately signal one of our brothers to go pray next to that person and to keep an eye on them, like be close to them in case they do something crazy. Um, we also have security at the gate when you come in. Um, I think it's a good practice that when you have your venue, you should have arrangements that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, loved perfume it and so we should encourage and have available for those who would like to put on some perfume that it's available in the masjid you know there should not be a reason why we shouldn't be able to have access to perfume if we do need to um, <clears throat> use it um, the other thing with the, the venue it's Make sure you have adequate garbage bins. Um, make sure that you know there's arrangements for people with disability. Sometimes, the, depending on the nature of our masjid, you know, it's sometimes very hard for people with wheelchairs or you know different um, disability to be able to. We want to make that experience as smooth and as easy for those people as possible. So part of the executive's um, role in preparing for Juma is that they have to cater for such people. Some people need chairs, they need to sit on, you know, and so the preparation for the Juma has to cater for that. You should have water available, um, especially at least for the Khatib and, you know, for those old elder folks who might need to have some water. You have to make sure the bathrooms are properly cleaned before the Friday and you have enough paper towel and supplies in there adequately sisters and brothers and that you have a team that will clean up after Jumwa and put back the place together so a lot of times we go to the mission on a Friday but we don't think of all of this you know but this is something that actually 
is being done by group of people or team of people in terms of preparing the place and setting it up. And so why I'm mentioning it all of this in detail is that it is good to volunteer, to be part of this and to help to set up venue. Don't just come every week and just, you know, enjoy the facilities without, if you are in a position where your job allows you a little extra time, you know, one and two Juma come and said, hey, you know, let me see how I can help out, you know, prior to that, to set up all of this. So that's the first um, part of what the organizers have to do in terms of getting the venue. They also have another role because the community is coming to them. And so they have to be able to um, be very clear in letting the community know how the whole format of the Juma is going to be. Um, so you will come to some masjids and you will see that they will do a bayan in front of the, this is done mainly by the brothers from the Indian subcontinent. Um, what they would do is that they would give a, a speech and then the azan is given for Juma. And so, and the reason they are doing this is because some of the, the brothers, they are following scholars who uh, adopt the viewpoint that the, the khutbah has to be given in Arabic alone and can't be given in any other language. And so they do not believe that it is correct to give the khutbah in English. And they say the prophet uh, never give it in English, so it should be in Arabic. So they adopt this position of giving it in Arabic alone. And so what happened is that they will do the khutbah and give it in Arabic alone. But if they just do that alone, nobody's going to come to Juma because they wouldn't understand anything that's being said. And most of the Muslims, they don't know any Arabic. And so in order to facilitate them doing Arabic alone and the member, they would give a, a little speech in English before the khutbah itself, before the adhan for the khutbah. And so they give that little bayan or that little speech in front, and then they will step on the member and then they will deliver their khutbah in Arabic very short. But the majority of their speech would be, you know, the message that they're giving. So sometimes you will come and you will see that. Sometimes you will come and the imam will give the khutbah on, in English on the member. So the masjid should alert you so you don't get confused that are we having a bayan before the adhan or are we having you know no bayan, just having the khutbah clear. Um, secondly, some masjids you go, they will have one adhan and not two adhan. You know, this is also um, two opinions that exist where, you know, um, you just give one adhan and that's it, you don't give two. Because the two azan was introduced actually in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they had one azan. Then Osman ibn Affan uh, introduced two because he realized that when you give one azan, the people were having a difficulty to get to the mischief. So they ended up giving two azan, one to alert the merchants and everybody out there that Juma time is approaching, you know, start to get head towards the mischief, and then the second azan. The dua. Sometimes you will go to the masjid and they make dua after salah. Um, the community, they should alert people whether they're having dua after salah or not. Um, this is also an issue of, of um, I think I, I, I don't know if I've ever covered it, but I want to go too much into it. Just know which, uh, if the masjid is going to have dua after salah so that the members can know. And announcements, if you're going to make announcements, there's always this big dispute. When are we going to have the announcement? Are we having an announcement before the Salah, after the Khutbah, between the Khutbah and the Salah? Are we having an announcement after the Salah? Are we having an announcement before the, the Khutbah? So that the community can know. And, this, and there's no good time to have it. Because if you have it before the Juma, before the Khutbah, then half the people don't show up. They come in late, so they miss the announcement. You know, um, If you have the announcement after the Salah, you know, then a lot of people leave immediately after the salah, so you don't they don't get to hear it. So there's debate. So some masjids do it between the khutbah and the salah, uh, and you have different ways in which this gets done. So, the, but the people should be informed of how we be doing that. This other thing about donation boxes, 
should we circulate donation boxes or should we not? And when should we do it? Can we do it during the khutbah? You know, or should we do it before the khutbah or don't do it at all? So all of those things, they need to, um, has to be organized by the, whoever is organizing that Juma and let the people know so that they don't be surprised by things that is happening. There's a third area which I think we don't do well, but we can really do an amazing thing and that is to organize a variety of services around the Jumu'ah day. Because you're having the community come and so you should capture that moment and utilize that moment. Your whole community is coming there. Why should we just limit it to they're just coming and listen to a khutbah and make salah and leave? So we have uh, many, many different services which could be done by different masjids. Um, I am trying also at my masjid to see to incorporate some of these things slowly over time. One is greetings at the door, that when you come in, people are greeting you. And this, of course, will be after COVID. Uh, so you have people greeting you at the door. This serves two purposes. If you have regular greeters, especially young people, um, they will notice who looks strange right away. So it's also a security issue, but also makes people feel welcome. Somebody come first time to the masjid. You know, it's a nice thing you come in for Juma and somebody's welcoming you, greeting. Um, it's a very good feeling. You can wrap recognition services. So you can say, for example, we take one minute from the Juma time and just recognize some family or recognize some individual for what they're doing. He says, brothers and sisters, I would like you to shake this brother's hands and recognize him. He is our brother who does all our landscaping and we ask Allah to bless him for whatever it is. And so you can have services that you can recognize people individually. Food sales, you can have food sales after the Jumu'ah, so, and many messages do do that one. Um, try to sell food um, for people. <clears throat> you can also organize, we have so many experts and so many professionals that come to the Jumu'ah. You can arrange with them, to set up a small little tent outside or a little area and you can say, those of you who would like to know what immigration, after Jumu'ah, there's an immigration lawyer that's going to spend 10 minutes out there. You can go and ask all your questions. Next week, we're going to have a doctor. The other week, we're going to have a lawyer, uh, an accountant. You talk about taxes or whatever. We can have a mechanic tell you how to maintain your car. And you can have different experts every week asking them to spend 10 minutes and whoever is interested in that particular area or skill set can go over there and engage them. And so in this way, we could, you know, utilize the talent of, of so many of our members of our community. You can distribute books and flyers, have table for distribute books and flyers. Um, blood drive, you can organize blood drive in which people can give blood on Friday. You can also offer blood pressure service, you know, check your blood pressure. You come early, an hour early, you know, have people to do that. So you can wrap many different services around the Juma as people are already coming there. So they get multi-benefit coming to the Friday prayer. The, the other one is um, to create, of course, a system for those in need that you um, make sure that they, they, they have access to getting help for those who may come to the masjid and you want to make sure that they are um, being helped. Elderly services, you know, like a lot of the elders now, especially they have gotten their vaccines and they are ready to come to the masjid. And so, but a lot of them don't drive you know, that you can organize services where they can be picked up and dropped back after the prayer um, so that they get to come out on Friday and enjoy the Jumu'ah. Children's services, you should have, you know, places where children become excited to come to Jumu'ah because they're going to get free candy. They're going to get a place to play and to interact. And so growing up, growing up in my country, one of the things that we used to look forward to on Friday was that people used to bring sweets from home. And they would bring all kinds of sweets and they would have it at Jumu'ah and then they would distribute this or share it out after. So you will look forward to getting a little bit of, of, of free 
sweets and, and different kinds of um, halwa and so on that you get after the Juma. Um, so we should have and cater for the kids to at least feel that Juma is a special memorable experience for them. One of the programs I had done, I had to stop it, was um, bring two and take two, which was to encourage people to give. But it became too big. So the whole idea behind it was uh, you bring two items from home to give away. Could be anything. Two tins of tuna, two pliers, uh, two towels, you know, whatever it is, you grab two things from your home because you should be in a constant state of always trying to, you know, de de stuff all this stuff you have at home and then, you know, start getting rid of things. So the idea was you bring two things and we put all on the table. And then when you're leaving, you take two. So you might bring two pliers, but I'm looking for a screwdriver. So I may pick up a screwdriver or whatever it is. So everybody bring two items. We lay them on the table. And then when you leave, take two. And whatever is left at the end, we usually give it to the Salvation Army or we give it to some you know, charitable place. But it got so big that we stopped it. Um, so there are over 30 different services, which I have... Um, you know, think that could happen around this. And um, uh, one of the things I'm hoping to do is actually to write a book about Jumu'a. I've been putting it on hold. I've collected all the information just to get it time to actually start doing the writing um, so that we can have and make this day very, very special. So those are just some ideas in terms of what we can do and wrap around the Jumu'a. Um, so when people come to Jumu'a, it's, it's memorable, it's beneficial. Jejumo have a social dimension to it. They have an educational dimension. It have an economic dimension. It have a spiritual dimension. You know, so there are many different parts of Jumo that we can come and benefit from, instead of it just being pray and leave. You know, and to begin to encourage people to those who can to spend a little more time instead of just praying and leave, spend an hour or two more and enjoy the different services. Um, the second kind of people who come to the Jumu'a is the attendees, all of us. And so the Prophet mentioned to us, every Muslim is obligated to wash on Friday, that is to make gusl, wear his best clothing, and also he should perfume if he have any. So this is uh, a hadith of Prophet. And the Prophet said, taking a bath before coming to Friday prayers, obligatory on every adult, Bukhari and Muslim. So one of the things you want to do as a person attending the prayer is you make sure on Friday you take ghusl, you make, you make a bath. And you try to wear your best clothes. It is, you know, sad sometimes to see the kind of clothing that people come to the masjid with. Uh, you think they're going to the mall or, you know, they're just hanging out. You know, you want to have a sense of reverence for the occasion. And so you want to dress properly. The prophet says, wear your best cloth. That's you, you. Because this is the highest moment you're, you're going to be participating in. You're going before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you want to dress well. The, the thing what happens is that in most companies, Friday is casual day. So, you know, a lot of them they have with them. Friday you can wear anything you want, casual dress day. And so we, we tend to wear, you know, terrible clothing. And then that's the day we're going for Juma. Um, so we should try to our older folks, my grandfathers, and, and so they actually used to wear their good clothes under their pants. They would have their pajama, their white pajama. Then they would put their pants on, and then they would go and do it. And then on Juma day, they take off their pants, and they would hang it up in the masjid. Uh, I remember that very vividly. Uh, and then have their good clothes. Uh, so you want to be able to really treat Juma as something special that you go into every Friday. So wear your best cloth. Uh, you should arrive early to the, the Jumu'ah. If you have the ability to do so, you should do that. It is Sometimes we see a lot of people coming late. It is because of two reasons. One, there is a misconception by some that feels that the khutbah is not important, the salah is the important thing. And so there are some brothers who they arrive late just to catch the salah. And the khutbah is not important. This is not. This is a misconception, right? Um, the khutbah for the Eid is optional. 
you know, the khutbah for the Jumu'ah, you have to arrive for it. Uh, and the second thing that people do is because they arrive late because really they, they are barely leaving some time from their jobs to catch the Jumu'ah. So sometimes they don't, are not able to arrive, you know, um, on time as they should. The Prophet mentioned in a hadith, we have one hadith here which says when the, when Friday comes at every door of the masjid, the angels, they stand there and they write down the names of the people as they come in. And then when the imam sits down to, to deliver the khutbah, the angels close that book and begin to listen to the khutbah. The Prophet also said when one washes himself and then goes to Friday prayer, it is considered as if he has donated a camel for the sake of Allah. However, that's if you catch the first hour. In other words, you come very early. And if he went the second hour, it is considered as if he has donated a cow. And if he come the third hour, it is as if he has given a sheep. And the fourth hour, as if he has donated a chicken. And the fifth hour, as if he has donated an egg. Then when the imam starts delivering the speech, the angels come and they listen to him. So the angels, they stand and they record. And in, if you go to the Muslim countries, you will see people line up for Jumu'ah after Fajr. You know, there's so many people after Fajr Salah, they're sitting there for Jumu'ah, making zikr, reciting Quran, waiting for the Jumu'ah. You know, so um, there was a very famous uh, khatib in Egypt. His name is Kish. You know, um, he was so powerful. People used to line up for long hours to come and listen the, the, the whole streets would be filled and he was such a prolific uh khatib that the authorities got very scared so they used to arrest him every friday for the period of juma put him in jail and then they would lose him afterwards because they got very terrified of the magnitude and the effect of his message um but he was blind so you want to arrive early, you made your, you, you dress well, you're smelling good, you know, you're in your best clothing, you had your bath, you arrived early, excited. The other thing that is required of you as an attendee is that you should take some money out to give sataka, to develop a habit that every Friday, Friday is the best day as we learned in the Hadith. So that's the day you want to give sataka, you know, the highest reward you get in our faith is from Sataka. So you want to put aside some money to throw and donate either to the masjid or to help a poor person or whatever. You want to be able to give some money on the day of Jumu'ah, right? Because it is truly a blessing you get. And then the Prophet mentioned that we must try to recite Surah Al-Kahf. Whoever recites Surah Al-Kahf on the day of Jumu'ah will have a light that will shine from him from one Friday to the next. If you can't recite the whole surah, at least the first 10 verses, you should try to recite on Friday. So if you're going early, that is one of the things you will want to do. You're going to recite Surah to cap the first 10 verses of the Quran. If you can't read it in Arabic, or you don't know to recite Arabic, then you can recite the surah or read the surah in English. But it is uh, one of those things that will bring great rewards to you. As we said, it will, a light will shine from you. Uh, and of course, reciting Surah Kaf protects you from the Dajjal, and there's so many other benefits of reciting Surah Kaf. When you arrive, you must park properly in the masjid. You know, don't be those persons who, they're coming so late, and then they just park anywhere and run in the masjid. You know, parking is an adab, is, a, is, is about manners, because we don't do that in any other place. You don't go any place and you just park willy-nilly. Only when it comes to the masjid, people feel they have the prerogative to park however they feel like. You know, and this is not correct. So if you are a younger person, you should try to park as far away as possible and walk to allow those near spaces to be for the elderly. Let the elderly people get those close places to the masjid. You try to park as far as you can if you're a young person and walk, you know, towards the masjid. Don't pick the nearest spot, even though you may arrive early. You know, this is a way of showing, cons you know, empathy and being aware to let the elder people get the near parking. But park properly, 
do not park in undesignated zones. And this is an adapt, this is an issue of, of, of manners. It's not very good. So you arrive, you're in the masjid, uh, you give your sadaqa money, you know, you should, you, you, as you walk in, you smile and you greet people with warmth and, you know, but you don't want to spend a lot of your time just chit-chatting. You know, you can do that any other time. You want to really, you know, get the benefit of this. And so you should get into the masjid, you know, sit down. And of course, what you have to do is to pray to raka tahitul masjid when you arrive. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ was very strict with this. He was in the middle of his khutbah one time and a man arrived and sat down, as we have in the hadith, and the Prophet turned to him and said, no, get up and pray the two raka. So the first thing you want to do when you arrive in the masjid is to pray those two raka. Then you sit down, pick up your Quran, you make zikr, and you, you know, and engross yourself in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't spend a lot of time just, you know, to chat. It's not a social event you're coming to. You're coming to do a great event, a great worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should at least try to, this is one of the things that I'm trying to encourage my masjid. The people that's sitting on you, that's just before COVID. You should introduce yourself to the person on the left and the right. Hey, my name is so-so-so. You know, nice to meet you. Instead of sitting as total strangers, if we begin to ask each other's name and introduce ourselves, eventually we'll get to know each other. It begins with a name. You know, so it's good to develop this practice of introducing yourself to people. Don't just say, how are you, brother? You know, said, my name is so-so, so how are you? What's your name? And then, you know, we develop that relationship. So try to always be conscious if you're sitting in a gathering, ask the persons on the two sides of you and introduce yourself to them. I don't think they will be upset by that. All right. Um, so those are some of the things that uh, we have to begin to do as attendees. Now, and that's before the khutbah. All of that that we just talked about was what you need to do before the khutbah started. Once the khutbah has started, You've got to be understand that there are certain responsibilities on you, right? Now, one, don't look to hug the walls. You know, there's the first thing people come, oh gosh, I get a good seat to hug in the wall, you know, bracing back on the wall. You know, don't develop that habit to do that because it leads to sleeping away and, you know, making yourself comfortable. You're sitting in the wrong direction, you know. Try to sit appropriately. Don't bother with the wall stuff. If you can't avoid it, unless you have a back problem, you know, <clears throat> or that you need to brace, generally try to, when you're going to masjid, sit properly in, in the saf. Uh, be very careful about sleeping away during the khutbah. Um, and this is something that sometimes people can't avoid it, they're tired. Uh, if you know that you're gonna sleep away, tell the person next to you, if I do snore, touch me, please. You know, or if you see me sleeping, you know, can you help me out by just giving me a you know, a little poke that I can keep awake. You're not allowed to talk during the khutbah. Um, this is really important that once the imam steps up and begin to talk with the member, you have to remain quiet. The prophet, peace be upon him said, if you told your friend to pay attention on Friday while the imam is delivering the khutbah, then you have committed a sin of vain talk. So even telling somebody, hey, keep quiet, somebody who may be talking, and you're trying to help them out. And so you turn to them and you say, hey, keep quiet, khutbah is going on. You have indeed made noise and you have indulged in vain talk. And so you have to be absolutely quiet uh, during the Jumu'ah prayer. So the other very important thing that we mentioned before is people come late and then they want to squeeze and push people in, you know, to, to create a space where none exist, you know, don't 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 do that. You know, um, you can't come late and then you want to be in the front staff, the second staff, the third staff. If it's filled out, stay at the back. Don't start pushing people and you know trying to create artificial spaces. There's another tendency that happens is some people feel they have reserved space. They're accustomed to being in one place during the daily salah. This is their place. 
They sit here, but in our religion, we have no reserves of. You could be the king or the pauper. When you come, whatever space is available, you can take one. There's nothing and nothing should be reserved for that special spot where someone come and if they catch you sitting on that spot, they say, hey, this is my place. We don't have that. Don't do that. A lot of people email during the khutbah. You know, we have to understand that, that that violates the whole context of the khutbah. And this is an education issue. So we have to encourage people, you cannot be emailing during the khutbah. You can't be on your phone during the khutbah. People also talk on their phone during the khutbah. You know, I've seen people talking during the salah. You know, we're praying and then the guy's on his phone saying, hey, I'm praying now, man. I can't talk to you now. I'm going to call you after, but I don't pray. And this is in the middle of the prayer. And you're hearing this, this guy talking on his phone. You know, so people do all of this. Uh, these are not proper etiquette. And as a person who's attending the Jumu'ah, we need to be educated about that. You've also got to be conscious to make sure that you put your phone on silent, you know, because some people, they have ringtones that are embarrassing and, and that embarrasses them and embarrasses everybody listening to it. So you have to be really careful that you make sure your phone is off. A lot of times when you hear these different things going off, you know, that is very embarrassing. Uh, preferably the best practice, if you, you know, you're not, you're not in a job that requires an emergency, is probably to just leave your phone in the car and come in, you know, for that moment. Hopefully you don't have such a great crisis that can't wait for that little period of time. Uh, when the khatib is giving the khutbah, one of the responsibilities of us as attendees is we must listen to the khutbah with attention. Many times I will just, for the fun of it, I will ask people, what did the khatib say? And you'll see like a blank stare on people's faces. They're just coming out the masjid. And I say, what did the imam say today? Oh man, you talk about Allah and whatever, and, you know, but they can't even mention one point or two point of what the imam says. So you want to make it a habit to yourself that I'm going to try to remember at least three points for this khutbah today, you know, that I'm going to try to absorb three things. You don't have to absorb the whole message. And then you're going to make a resolve to act on one of them. So I said, I'm going to learn three things today and I'm going to practice one. I'm going to give myself a work and, you know, go try to action item one of these things. It's because you're there anyway, you know, rather than zoning out and getting your mind to wander, listen to the khutbah. Um, the couple of other things that they, they, the person attending have to do as well is when you come in, you, you make your, your, your two rakat, you sit down. Now the Imam give the, the, the Muazzin gives the Adhan for the khutbah to start. Um, there is different ways in which people uh, practice based on your school of thought. So you will see sometime where the person will not pray any sunnah before the khutbah. Whereas you will see others will pray sunnah. They're both okay. Um, the Prophet ﷺ himself, after the Jumu'ah Salah, he never used to pray any sunnah in the masjid. He used to go home and pray the sunnah. So, if you see some people getting up after the Salah and not praying the sunnah, don't get panic or don't think that they're doing something wrong. Uh, you should greet each other um, after the Salah. This is the attendees after the Salah after the khutbah is over. So you pray the sunnah, you greet each other. Um, and the support services that we talked about, you wanna go meet that expert over there, you wanna do a job networking, you wanna find out, you know, we should have all of these services, whatever it is we organize around the Juma, you should be made aware of them and you can go and benefit from them after the Juma and donate to the masjid uh, to support the, the effort. Give you a sadaqah towards it. A um, couple of other things that you need to do after the Salah is besides listening to the announcement, don't just run out if you have the time, sit and listen to the announcement to be updated what's happening in the community. should always be interested in what's happening in the community. 
And then you could also go and ask the khatib if you think that the khatib made a mistake. You could go and say, hey, I, I heard you say so, so maybe I'm wrong. I mean, or my understanding is so. You can have clarification with the khatib, or you may go and ask a question of an additional point or something else. Uh, and then you would like to make sure you share that message with other people as well. Uh, today at Juma, you know, I learned so, so, so. And then there's an hour on the day. The Prophet said Friday has 12 hours, one of which is an hour where if you make dua to Allah, then Allah will answer it. So throughout the day, you want to be able to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hoping to catch that hour. And the third entity that is very important for the successful implementation of Juma is the Khatib himself. And the Khatib has to be able to have some Islamic background, should have some public speaking ability. And that is a whole large section, you know, how to, how to use voice modulation, how to deliver, how to present the message in an interesting, motivating way. Uh, he should be able to make his message relevant, solution oriented, practical, that people can take it and, and go and apply it. Don't make the message so complicated. Don't give the people too much. Don't make Islam seem hard to them. You know, don't show them they come in with 10 problems and you show them five more that they have, which they didn't know about. Rather give them solutions for some of those. Uh, some khatib, they don't prepare. One of the things I've learned very early is that it is such an incredible opportunity that you have the best of your best coming there and sitting on your floor and says, okay, talk to me. You have half an hour. Move me, motivate me, teach me. You know, we go to psychiatrists and so to get those kind of things. And here you have these people come, the cream of the cream, and they said, hey, I'm going to stay quiet for half an hour. You go ahead. You know, move me, motivate me. And so I don't treat that moment as, I treat that, that opportunity as very special. And so you have to prepare yourself properly when you are a khatib. I've heard imams, one imam said, when I'm putting my shoes to go in the masjid, and to make that walk from the door of the masjid to the khutbah, the, 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 the member, that's when I prepare my khutbah. And he proudly said that. You know, he said, I don't prepare anything. When I put my shoe and I start to walk to the member, that's when I prepare my khutbah. You don't want to be like that. That to me is insulting the, the, the congregation who comes. So you must prepare well, you must be motivated. And the salah, there's a hadith of the prophet, but he says you must make the salah and the khutbah custom moderate for people. Don't make it long and drawn out. So these are some of the, 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 the responsibility of the khatib uh, while he's delivering the message. And you have to be able to have all of that to deliver a proper message that is clear, beautiful, solution-oriented, inshallah. We're running out of time, so I'm going a little bit faster. And lastly, the khatib also has a role after the, 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 the khutbah, the salah. A lot of time, the khatib will stay there and make all kinds of sunnah, and by the time he comes out, people are left. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he would delay sunnah and pray it later at home. You know, you want to be able to, when you're the khatib, soon as you finish praying, get out there as quick as possible to meet the people, to interact with them, you know, to answer their questions, to help them. They may have things they want to help in. To invite them to the, you know, the different services that the masjid have and let them know different programs we have. To solicit volunteers, you know, because they listen to the imam or the, the khatib and says, you know, see if you can recruit them to do some work for the masjid. So the khatib's role doesn't end with just the Juma and the salah. Uh, he should be out there interacting and trying to do these different things. So this is a basic idea of some of the things that we, hopefully, if we are able to get it right, the day of Juma can be truly a special moment for all of us and move each and every one of us to become better with every Jumu'ah, you know. Um, but it takes commitment and it takes resolve from all the different elements and entities that we are required for Jumu'ah to become special, you know. But if we begin to do some of these, I think our community will begin to actually show interest in the affairs of the Muslims because they're coming on Friday and they will want to know more and do more because of the um, incredible experience that they will have for Jumu'ah. May Allah help us to get there.